Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm Bethany Lewis, the Concussion Coach. I'm a neurological occupational therapist and certified life coach, and I specialize in guiding people through their concussion recovery journey. I am passionate about helping people understand their injury, speed up their recovery, and reclaim control over their life post-concussion. The purpose of this podcast is to help increase awareness of concussions and the impact they can have on a person's life, and to bring hope to people who have suffered a concussion and those who love them. I firmly believe that sharing stories and knowledge about concussions will bring important light and understanding to this misunderstood and often invisible injury. The information in this podcast is meant to bring that awareness and hope and is not meant as medical advice. The opinions shared are those of the interviewees and my own. If you are suffering with lingering concussion symptoms, I have created a concussion coaching program specifically for you. I will be your mentor to guide you through your recovery journey, offering help with understanding and managing your symptoms, setting achievable goals, and learning how to manage your own thoughts and nervous system in order to get control over your life again. If this program sounds like something that would help you or someone you love, sign up for a free consultation. In the consultation, you'll get valuable information and resources and gain hope for your future. Sign up for your free consultation at the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm so excited to have Brooke Mills as my guest today. Brooke currently serves the state of New Hampshire as the current Miss New Hampshire 2023 and will go on to represent the Granite State at Miss America in 2024. Some of her accomplishments include serving as the spokesperson and event coordinator for the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation and published research author, founder of Choose Health, an educational program for empowerment of youth to make healthy choices, founder of National Concussion Awareness Day, raised over $11,000 for the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire, and has served on eight international chiropractic mission trips over her lifetime. She has advocated for brain injury awareness as a peer-to-peer lecturer on behalf of the Brain Injury Association for the past nine years since her brain injury in 2014. Brooke is a graduate of Sherman College, where she obtained her degree as a doctor of chiropractic this June. Brooke, this is quite the bio. Thank you so much (laughs) for being here and for sharing your story with us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be able to chat anything about concussions. Right? I feel the same way. (laughs) Um, So tell us more about your injury. How Well, I guess we know how long ago it was. It was in 2014. What, What happened? Yeah, so in March of 2014, I was in my mandatory freshman year of gym class, and uh, we were playing team handball. It was the very first period of the day, 8 a.m. I had to go to gym class, which is just awful. Uh, but I, we were playing team handball, which is like soccer and basketball combined. And so I went to go pick up a ball, and a boy went to go kick that same ball and ended up kicking the left side of my face, knocking me unconscious. Wow. Um, my gym teachers had all all stepped out of the room uh, at that time. Nobody was monitoring the game. And so the game continued on. And thankfully, a classmate was able to help wake me up and get me onto my feet and, and escorted me to the bathroom, where I started to watch my black eye develop before my eyes. And um, uh, then I unfortunately got lost on the way to the nurse's office. I don't remember too much from that day, but I know that uh, after being a freshman, it was March. So I had been in that school for a little while and knew my way to the nurse's office, but I got lost and um, obviously sent home because I was showing signs of having sustained a brain injury or concussion uh, from from the get-go. So um, I most notably had light sensitivity right off the bat. Within about six hours after my brain injury, I had memory issues. So I was walking into a room not remembering what I was doing. I lost about five years of memory. So two and a half years before my brain injury, I have no recollection of. And then two and a half years after that, I had pretty much daily amnesia. So I wasn't remembering what had happened the day prior. And so there's no memory that I have of the two and a half years post-concussion. I also had headaches for the first time in my life. I had never had headaches as a 14-year-old, really healthy young adult that was under uh, wonderful chiropractic care and really took care of my body. So uh, headaches and migraines were really new to me. I also had balance problems. I was a competitive dancer. And so um, I had always had really great balance and coordination, which obviously uh, really took a turn for the worst as well. Yeah. Holy cow. That's a lot of things to be dealing with immediately. And you, what kind of care did you get right away? Sound They sent you to the nurse and they sent you home and then what? <laughs> yes. Uh, so 
I had never played any sports before in my entire life. So I was really unaware of the world of concussions and what concussions were. And so was my mom. She was a mother of two young girls and um, had never really had that thought cross her mind. She's a doctor of chiropractic. And so she had seen some patients come in, especially younger boys who play sports, uh, come in with concussions and um, making sure that their spine was well adjusted. So she adjusted me. Um, We had a salad. I remember drinking a juice and she thought I would be good to go back to school. And so that same day that I was kicked in the head, she sent me back to school. And as a straight A student, I fell asleep in my English class and English. It was an honors lit class, but I fell asleep in English was my favorite class. And so that was my true red flag that something was, was wrong and that my life might not ever be the same again. So that was my second time going home that day. And um, after that, I didn't return back to school for three months. We really saw all my symptoms come to fruition about six hours after my brain injury, a lot of fatigue, mood swings were to follow, a lot of sleep disturbances. I was sleeping throughout the day and then not being able to sleep at night. And so I had to take three months off of school because I couldn't keep my eyes open that long. Light light and screens were really difficult for me. Um, My left eye lagged. And so I was having difficulty reading. I was getting motion sick in cars, so I couldn't even make it to school on top of all the memory issues and the headaches that I was going through. So those three months at the time, back in 2014, we were still under the understanding that it was sleeping, resting, no screens, no movement. I really was isolated for quite a long time. And I also suffered from POTS syndrome after my brain injury. And so I had difficulty going from laying down to sitting up and sitting up to standing while maintaining my blood pressure and my blood oxygen level. So it was really challenging for me to walk to the mailbox or walk to the end of my street. And so um, that didn't really encourage me to make movement a priority throughout my um, recovery process. So it was quite the lay low. I ate really I ate a wonderful diet of high antioxidants and a lot of good fats, a lot of avocado and salmon and removed any and inflammatory foods from my diet because I knew that my body needed to take all the tools possible to be able to regrow and and heal from the inside out. And then after that, uh, when I still wasn't getting better in the six weeks that I thought brain injury would totally heal from because (laughs) obviously I was new to concussions, new to brain injuries. And so when Google tells you you're going to be fine in three to six (laughs) weeks, you expect by at least week six, you're going to be perfectly fine. And uh, when that week six rolled around, that's when we we were really worried uh, because nothing had changed. And so my mom took me to the New Hampshire concussion specialist at the time. And um, he gave me a prescription for six different drugs, one of which was a a trial medication for Alzheimer's. And I was 14 years old still at the time. And so that um, was just not going to happen as well as higher levels of pain medication than a 14 year old should ever need. And other cognitive antidepressants and and whatnot. Um, So that wasn't happening. I did not take any of those prescriptions. You didn't take any of them? No, I did not. Uh, We we left there feeling poorly for a lot of people that must go into that office and taking all of those six prescriptions. It's just not in my um, understanding of the world to to take so many medications and make band-aid fixes on something that was wrong with my brain and not getting to the root cause of it. So, um, but people that don't have that philosophy or that outlook on life, I became really concerned for. And so that was what really triggered my passion for educating others on concussions and starting to create more conversations surrounding concussions so that people didn't feel so alone. Because if I didn't have my prior understanding and just uh, values in life, I guess, and my mother, then I would have been leaving on six medications that I would probably be on now 10 years later. And so 
my mom reached out to Care Brain Center, which was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. And he is an incredible pioneer in neuro rehab. And so um, I went to Atlanta, Georgia for two weeks at a time, three times for rehabilitation. That's when we saw that my left eye was lagging, which was causing my issues in classroom, in um, reading because it, it would uh, skip it looked like a little jumping eye, uh, which yep. is so crazy to actually be able to see when my right side would would work fine. So it's it's quite crazy how amazing our brain and our body is. And I really got to see some true depth into that during that rehabilitation process. Um, we also pretty much strapped me to the table for hours at a time. And I went up and down and up and down waiting for my blood pressure and my blood oxygen level to maintain more stability. And so it, there's so many just different cool ways and gateways into the brain that we're able to utilize for rehabilitation, which is so interesting. Um, so I'm really grateful that I had that process and I really didn't see all that much improvement. Um, my family could my family saw improvement in myself, but I didn't, um, which is hard to keep and maintain hope when uh, it's it's challenging like that. But can I just ask a question? So can you tell me the name of the clinic again? Yes, it is Carrick Brain Center. He is no longer taking patients. He is only an educational source now. Mm -hmm. um, so at the time, it was educational as well. And so there all the rooms and rehabilitation centers that I was in uh, were one sided mirrored walls. And so there were constantly clinicians looking in on my care, which was really interesting to, to see how he was, um, you know, fostering this understanding for the next generations to kind yeah. of carry on his work. Well, that's fantastic. And did you, how did you handle getting there? Did you fly down there? I assume. I had to fly. Like, yes. Driving was really problematic. How did, how did you manage that? Yes, flying was an instant migraine every single time. I would go through security and through the airport with sunglasses on constantly because the lights on airplanes were just weird. Um, and they were very triggering for me. And mm -hmm. so I um, constantly kept any new nutrients in my body. I remember eating a lot just to kind of combat some of the fatigue that I would have throughout that day. And, um, and, and a lot of sunglasses. Wow. What were, what were the things that were easily transportable that you ate as healthy fuel? I ate a lot of apples and almonds and almond butter. I'm allergic to gluten and dairy. So that's a lot of our inflammatory foods <laughs> cut out already. Um, but I would, I would eat anything that I could get my hands on that was gluten free. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Um, so how long did you end up going to the clinic in Georgia? So I did uh, three rounds in Atlanta and they would be spanned from about a week to two weeks and my parents would take shifts so they would come down for one would come with me for the beginning and then the other would come down at the end of the week yeah and was it were they back to back like it was one to two weeks and then one to two weeks and one to two weeks and they were spread out um I think the I went about four months in between oh, okay yeah. So it started at um, around eight or nine months after my brain, brain injury. And then every four ish months after that for the three times. That's awesome. And did you feel like you said that you didn't necessarily feel the changes yourself, but your family noticed them? Um, was that the entire time, like all three rounds? Or by the end of it, were you starting to notice differences for yourself? I think by the end, I was able to notice a little bit of differences by the third round, especially when it comes to the POTS or the issues with walking. I was able to start walking a little bit further. I couldn't do any strenuous exercise uh, for about four years after my brain injury, but being able to walk a little bit further and go on family walks was really powerful for me to be able to just um, have a little bit more of normalcy and the way that I got around because I looked fine. That's the that's the thing with concussions is it's so invisible and nobody could understand how I would get so fatigued going from one side of my school to the other side and and things like that. So I definitely started to notice an impact there as well as uh, my sleep schedule start to regulate more. Mm. And I know my parents saw started to see my personality come back, which was probably the most impactful and powerful 
a thing that they could have seen come back for me. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that was very encouraging for them. Mm-hmm. That's something that I hear a lot is people are so distraught that they've they feel like they've lost their loved one or and and the person often feels like they've lost themselves too. It's uh yeah. it's, it's a, not a very nice injury <laughs> no it's not <laughs> not so so they were seeing progress and so is that why you kept going or like what what kept you going through those three rounds what kept me going was knowing that there was still more work to be done I'm the person that cannot leave a project unfinished my mom it would kill my mother in elementary and middle school when I had a school project to do and I was the one that would take over the group project and make sure it was done and I wasn't going to stop even if it was two in the morning and it was definitely time for bed Um, (laughs) and so I knew that there was still so much that I could regain Mm. and um, the the clinicians there gave me so much hope and instilled so much in me and and honestly reminded me that it could be so much worse uh, because they have had NFL players and professional snowboarders and skateboarders come in that are in much worse shape than I am and they don't know if they'll ever get back to 100%, back to better. But they were able to encourage me and really feel like I was going to fully recover. That's huge. That that. Mm-hmm. Hope is huge. So how did it work with school? Was that okay for you to be leaving that often? Um, How did you guys manage that? I don't remember too much, but I know that my mom had to send a lot of emails and had to talk to a lot of people. Uh, Leaving for three months at the end of my freshman year was a challenge, especially if um, where half of my teachers did not believe in concussions or did not believe that they were a big deal. Uh, my, my math teacher was the assistant coach of the football team. And then my gym teacher was obviously the head coach of the football team. And they did not like that I was excused from so much work and so much class time and continued to pass all of my classes um, because I had to have accommodations. And so I did go through the return to learn guidelines. I was the first one in my high school to ever have that be put to use. And we are a, we are a high school of about 1500 students. And so for me in 2014 to be the first is it's a far stretch that I should have been the first to utilize these guidelines. And so it was all a practice run, pretty much. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything was new. And so the nurse's office, thankfully, was really supportive in helping um, un- teachers understand the guidelines and the restrictions that I had. And when I did go back to the classroom, pretty much that following year, so my sophomore year in high school, I did half class time. And so I would do uh, 30 minutes of a class out of a 90 minute block or an hour block. I would do 25 to 30 minutes and then rest in the nurse's office and sleep for 30 minutes. And so that was the ongoing process for quite some time. I know that I had doctor's notes for all of the rehab that I had to um, undergo in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I'm pretty sure they were understanding. Again, my memory is not all there, but and I did not handle the bulk of um, being my biggest advocate because at 14 years old, I was really lucky and grateful to be able to have my mom advocate for my needs. Yeah, no, that's such a blessing and and a really big deal to have someone who believes you and knows what it's like and sees what's happening for you and mm-hmm. willing to go to bat for you. How did you guys handle and deal with people not believing you? That's a that's a challenge that I think a lot of people with this invisible injury deal with. Any any thoughts or advice on that? I wish I had more thoughts and advice. Um, with my memory issues, that became the bulk of me pretty much being dismissed from my friend group. My I lost my best friend in the in the process because I couldn't remember inside jokes. I couldn't remember movies watched. I couldn't remember I couldn't remember gossip. I didn't I didn't know anything. And so I really lost all of my friendships and felt isolated in that manner. And then um I got pretty used to people just not taking my injury or the symptoms that I have and continued to experience seriously that I just kind of was off in my own little world. And I really, it was a time of survival for myself throughout that, the rest of my freshman year and sophomore year. And it wasn't until my junior year that I started 
being able to take more onto my plate. So being in clubs and getting back into the honor society and things like that, that I started to feel like I had a little bit more support, but I was still known as that concussion girl. So my biggest avenue was giving back to the concussion um, community. And so I started as a blog. It was called the Finding My Way blog. I started it just uh, maybe two or three months after my concussion. I wanted to advocate and create more conversations surrounding concussions. So I documented the humor in having severe memory loss. I documented new research that was coming out about concussions because I found it found it extremely difficult to find good research that was coming out, changing the narrative surrounding concussions. And then we started understanding that some light 10 to 15 minutes of light aerobic exercise is what's better to create more cognitive advancements after a concussion and after a brain injury. So I just wanted to be a little bit more of a pillar of support for other people that might be going through something similar to myself. And then I partnered with the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire and started as a peer-to-peer lecturer. And so this is what truly got me out um, into the communities and speaking to students about taking concussions seriously. And so just by talking to students and encouraging them to take them seriously, and to advocate for their peers and appreciate their peers that might be experiencing invisible injuries, whether that be even depression or anxiety or familial loss, all of these things that are also semi-invisible and challenges in individuals' lives because we never know what somebody's truly going through, especially on the inside. So that was what really helped me feel a little bit more supported and um, helped me stay above water on those those difficult and challenging days. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you find that with the peer-to-peer lecturing that people came to you and like shared their stories with you that nobody else knew about? Is that a thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. After every single talk that I did, um, it was somebody that was appreciative. A lot of women that didn't, especially didn't feel like their concussions were taken seriously. I think our, our men, especially our sports players and our boys, they probably don't get the help and don't get the support that they need. And they continue on going forth with life. And so when a female comes in with a brain injury or a concussion and get these special accommodations, I think they tend to take a little bit more extra frustration out. Um, that's what I, at least I saw because we had a huge football team that I was in class with all the time and did not feel that I deserved the accommodations that I had gotten because they were still under that misconception that concussions don't need to be taken seriously and so on and so forth. Mm, that is really, really interesting. And I just want to go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned the the accommodations. One of the accommodations that you had was to go to half of the class and then go to the nurse's office and sleep. So would you like back to back classes? That's what you would do. You'd go to class and then sleep and then go to class and sleep. And that's what yep. your brain needed. Yes. I think we had six class periods a day. And yes, that's what I did wow. consistently. Um, and I, I got out of a, um, a typing class because I couldn't do the screens and monitors. And so they sent me home with a uh, typewriter. And so oh, I had to do some, I had to do some extra work at, at home um, and space out my work so that I could rest and, mm-hmm. and then do a little bit of work at a time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow that's amazing. So I, I'm glad to hear that you were able to get these accommodations and that you guys, yeah, advocated for you and your needs. That's huge. <laughs> and, and it's paving the way for other people, which I think is a beautiful and really important thing. Um, tell me what other, what, were there other programs or concussion like specific health stuff that you did (laughs) other than the clinic in Atlanta? Other than the specialist um, that I use with quotations, because it's hard to just say that um, spending two minutes with a patient and handing you six prescriptions is a concussion specialist in my eyes. But no, that was really the all that I had went through. I started making new connections in the state of New Hampshire because speaking to so many young teens and parents and coaches that wanted more information and wanted um, some more support on a um, clinical level, I wanted to be able to refer people somewhere closer because it's not always very feasible 
to get down to Atlanta, Georgia, or yeah. some of these bigger rehabilitation brain concussion centers that are located across America. Um, and so I befriended a eye doctor who does some concussion testing and um, he calls it a different version of a baseline test that's all off of your eyes and um, balance and your vestibular system and so on and so forth and so he offers this opportunity for all sports players to come in and get this really amazing clinical baseline test that you can't cheat <laughs> that um, is able to be utilized if they sustain a concussion. And he also has some rehabilitation in his eye center. So I was able to host quite a few um, concussion nights and discussions with him uh, to be able to just create more awareness in his community that he's there and he exists because it's hard to come by. Um, and then really knowing how much the eyes are a gateway into our brain and healing our brain at the same time it was so crazy it's i can't even wrap my head around it now it's it's very wild it's very wild if you haven't seen it in action um, i'm sure you can google some like the videos of people's eyes after a concussion with those goggles and you really get to see see their eyes and the way that things track and move and whatnot so um, I wanted to really be able to refer people to him. Yeah. Yes. No, that is something that I think is a surprise to a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. I know at the clinic that I work at, that's one of the things, first things that people always say, I'm like, when they're, they're like, I had no idea that my eyes were having so many issues because <laughs> you yes. think like, you can have 20, 20 vision still, but that doesn't mean your eyes are working and the, the processes with your brain are working and it yeah. does make a huge difference. I did an interview with a vision therapist, like a neurooptometrist, and he mm -hmm. talked all about that. It's really fascinating and really helpful, I think. But who it just for the people in New Hampshire who might be listening to this, do you want to give a referral to your, your Yes. Eye this is Dr. Cretunis. He is in Belmont, New Hampshire, near Laconia. Um, so he's up in the Lakes region and um, he has got in focus eye care. That's okay. his clinic name. Awesome. Thanks. We can link to that in the show notes here. And so how long after you did your treatment in Georgia, did you start to feel like, did you continue to feel better over the years? Like, it sounds like by junior year, you said you were able to start doing more and taking more control of your life. Like, how did that process come about for you? Yes, I definitely, by my junior year, was able to I like to say I adapted to some of the struggles that I had obtained after my brain injury. I, I learned how to take really great notes. I learned I needed to ask a lot more questions and revisit notes a lot more frequently. I was never that straight A student that I was prior to my concussion, but I made it through school. I made it through with, with my B's and C's and I was happy and I understood that it was not worth the extra stress and strain on my brain to try to continually memorize things because I really just, I had a capacity. And so I, um, I tried to spread myself as thin as I could and really just get as much out of my, out of my high school experience and out of my life each year, even though it was a little bit more challenging for me than anybody else. But I learned how to keep a really great detailed paper schedule. And so I have calendars dating back to 2014 because I, I wanted to write everything down. I started journaling a lot more so that I could go back and read my journal entries and kind of re-remember my life. And I learned how to take a lot of photos and document all of the things so that I could look back on it later. And so I still wasn't able to physically do many demanding things. I was able to do very, very light aerobic exercise. I could walk about a mile three years after my brain injury. And that was it. And I used to be a competitive dancer dancing 14 hours a week. I could run a mile in under eight, nine minutes. So I was in, I was in really great shape before my brain injury. And so that was continually uh, exhausting to try to re-navigate. And I remember going to Brain Injury Day on Capitol Hill. It's in March. Um, the Brain Injury Association had me there speaking and I was able to speak to some senators and House representatives about supporting bills that were supporting brain injury survivors, especially traumatic brain injury survivors. And I would speak to so many different 
obviously survivors there at the events and they would tell me that five years and eight years later they saw the most amount of healing even if you didn't do anything differently and at my two and a half three years it just felt like that was never going to happen I wasn't seeing many more advancements in my health and the things that I was still going through I still had headaches once or twice a week. I still wasn't obviously able to walk more than a mile. Um, I still had a lot of memory issues, short-term and long-term, even though it was continually improving. I struggled in school. I still had a lot of more mood swings than I did prior. And um, I also saw my hormones kind of go out of whack, which I think when you get a brain injury, anything can be affected because our brain yeah. controls everything. So as a as a young female who had just gone through puberty before sustaining a brain injury, I think it really threw some some knots in that basket. Um, and so I continued to see a lot of challenges and I couldn't believe that people continue to see advancements and improvements in themselves five years later. And when my five years came around, it was so true. Um, I really could not believe that they were all right. And that, you know, sometimes the biggest healing factor is time. And we truly cannot rush and change time and our body's ability to repair neurons and create new connections and allow us to continue to live our lives in a different way and continue to improve. But I really saw so much improvement happen at five years. My word recall improved. I was able to felt like learn more and accept more and I had just more brain space for things and so I was able to do more and so on and so forth but I continued to see improvements until about eight years and then now I'm almost at 10 this this March will be my 10 years and do you feel like you're pretty much back like you or there's still things that you're symptoms that you're dealing with biggest part is memory. I mean, it was the biggest um, issue for me straight off the bat with the five years of memory that I still don't have any recollection of. And it continues to be a struggle now. But 10 years later, it's kind of just who I am. And people will generally forgive me if I forget anything. But I'm a master at setting reminders. Um, I use Google Calendar religiously uh, because as an adult, you can't always just carry around your paper calendar like you could as a student. So I use Google Calendar now and all my reminders and I write down notes and I still take all the photos that I can and I revisit everything. Hmm. That's that's beautiful. So did you, um, what was the thing that surprised you most about your con- concussion experience? Because you said you didn't know much about concussions to start with, but was there anything that was like the most shocking to you or, or like unexpected? Gosh, I, I could say everything, truly everything. I think the biggest shock for me was understanding that because people couldn't see my injury, that it just so was not taken seriously. I remember going back into school, I, I journaled about this heavily. So I remember it. I can look back on it. Um, my The gym teacher who was not in the room at the time, pretty much had a talking to me at my lunch hour. He came up and sat next to me and, and told me that everything was in my head and that I was crazy and that concussions like that, I would be fine in no time. And it had already been three months because that was by the time I was able to go back into school. And he had a son who was in my grade that I had math class with. And I went to elementary school and middle school with. And so it really, um, really put on my heart that, you know, people really can't relate to things that they can't see or that they haven't experienced themselves and gave me much more of an appreciation for being your own advocate and um, speaking up for your needs. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mentioned that. And thank you for sharing that. How did, speaking of advocacy and people believing you or not, um, how did, how did this impact your family? And how did they, why do you think they believed you? Why did they advocate for you the way that they did? I grew up with a single mother, and so she's the only parental figure I've really ever had. And so with that, I'm kind of her doppelganger. I I then grew up to be a chiropractor, obviously, and so I continue to be her doppelganger. But she knew me so well, inside and out, and she knew so quickly that she she witnessed my personality changes. She witnessed issues that I had never experienced in my entire life. 
And I know that um, the personality changes and the severe memory loss were really telltale flags that I wasn't making this up and um, things that I wouldn't want to have forgotten. She, I know she took me to London and Paris that summer after my brain injury, and I have absolutely no recollection of it. It was back in a time where I was not good about taking photos and um, documenting everything. And so I can't even remember where we went, what we did when we were there. I just know that I went to London and Paris after my brain injury. And so she she knew that if she wasn't my advocate, then I wouldn't have had anything. And she really understood and took the job very well that um, she was the person that believed in me and, and supported me. And so I really, I feel for people that are possibly older. I couldn't imagine being a 24 year old woman now experiencing a concussion or a brain injury that was as debilitating as the one 10 years ago to, to lose three months of work and to have to navigate that in the workplace or um, driving. I was very lucky to not have even started driving. And mm -hmm. so I know people who have suffered a brain injury at 17, 18, 19 or older, and they can't drive anymore, or they have issues driving. But I got to navigate learning how to drive post concussion, which is really nice. I mean, it, uh, I, I couldn't wish a concussion on anyone, but I really don't I don't know what I would have did, done to navigate that as an adult. It's really, really challenging to, to think about. Yeah, uh, I'm so grateful that you had your mom. It sounds like she's wonderful. What advice would you give to the people who are loving and trying to help a, a family member or loved one who is dealing with a concussion? Uh, my biggest advice right after a concussion, if it's very new and anything's happening or you're still seeing a lot of symptoms, I love when caretakers can document things. My mom was really great about documenting what days were like for what um, the symptoms that I was experiencing most on those days to try to look for trends, to try to look for improvements. Because when that person that you're trying to love and support doesn't feel any better, but you're seeing changes in them, you have that to look back on and you have things to continually try to reiterate to them that your body is doing the best that that it can and that they are going to continue to heal and that they are you know, loved and supported. It's really challenging to be able to navigate. And I haven't had to be in that role, um, but I was on the other side on that receptive side. And so any love and encouraging, supporting words were so helpful for me. Mm. Yes, thank you. What things were most helpful for you in discovering and loving yourself post-concussion? There's so many changes. You don't feel like yourself. What what helped you to get to that point? Mm. My grandfather was a state trooper. And um, growing up with a single parent, I, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And my grandfather would always tell me that everything happens for a reason. And so I felt like what what helped me the most internally was knowing that this was a part of my story for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's sad and it's challenging, but I had over, overcome other struggles in my life. Um, my father suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder after coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I lost a father figure at about five years old and overcame that and challenges at home witnessing his drug and alcohol abuse. And so that was a part of my story for its perfect reason to be able to um, have so much more love in my heart for our veterans and people who come back from serving overseas and trying to support our veterans that are coming back into uh, civilian life and so on and so forth. And I knew that this was going to be part of my story. It was leaving a legacy of concussion awareness. And so I can continually had to try to look at the positive, even during the bouts of depression I experienced after my concussion. You just, I really, really had to look at its purpose in my life. And so that's how I flipped it into the most positive script I could was giving back to this community. Um, my words of encouragement would really be to get involved. If you have a brain injury association in your state, they have support groups. You can lead a support group. You can be a part of a support group. You can start a support group. You can always start a blog. You can um, 
you know, write a column for your local newspaper on concussions or your experience with a concussion. Um, you can start speaking to schools or be at wellness events and advocate for concussions um, because that's really where I found the most purpose in my injury. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is really beautiful. And I love that, that perspective that if there's purpose to the hard things we go through, like then there we can deal with them. But yes. the, that pain that is purposeless, that it just feels so hopeless and we want to go into despair with. So I, I really love and appreciate that, that reminder and that perspective. Thank you for sharing that. It's um, challenging, but it is truly all about our perspective. Yeah, I, I struggled with it too, but um, it really took that repetitive mindset and challenging myself to think differently about the situation. Yeah. Was there anything that helped you to do that? Because I'm sure, I mean, depression, anxiety is definitely a part of people's story who are dealing with concussions. Um, just there are so many changes, so many things in your body, the hormones that like, there's so much going yes. on that it's totally understandable <laughs> that this would be <laughs> a, a part of that story. But how did you try to remember to keep that perspective or what, what helped you in that process? Mm. Have you ever heard of people who like get addicted to working out or like you see a change in yourself and you just kind of get addicted to that? Mm -hmm. um, I I had the first young student come up to me expressing their story of overcoming a concussion and nobody believing in them and the things that they went on. Thankfully, they felt like they were pretty much healed you know, three months later, which is still post concussion symptoms mm -hmm. and whatnot. But they saw that healing and they just appreciated me coming into that their classroom to speak about concussions because that was something that had challenged them. And so um, really, I fed off of those moments. And so I really relied on and appreciated the feedback that I got from talking to people about concussions. I remember the very first little radio show that, that I went on to talk about what I started as New Hampshire's Concussion Awareness Day before it went on to become National Concussion Awareness Day. I think I had maybe a minute segment and a caller came in afterwards uh, and they took it while I was still in the studio. And it was a gentleman being so appreciative that I was helping change the narrative on concussions. And so at 15 years old, that was so powerful for, for me that at least one person heard it because you never know who's listening and if anybody's actually accepting and understanding what you're saying and what you're putting out there because it's just the world that we live in today so finding those moments that make it all feel worth it was what really kept that fire under me yeah oh i love that thank you and i think that yes that turning it to service turning it outward and trying to help people with the struggles that you're dealing with is just a really beautiful perspective thank you for that so through this process, was there anything that people said or did that was particularly helpful for you, especially in the early days of the injury? You might have kind of talked about it with this in general, but just again, as people are people who know someone who's had a concussion, what could they say or do that might be of use to someone dealing with this? Absolutely. I think the biggest thing always comes back to feeling supported. So if you're around somebody that's sustained a concussion or a brain injury, knowing that they are supported by you. Um, I would have done anything to feel supported by my friends, especially. Uh, it's always one thing for your family because I felt like they're my blood and my mom was always going to support me, <laughs> even if I was like a loony bin show. Um, but uh, be, being supported by other people outside of your circle or in your circle, but just feeling those words of encouragement. I think constantly going back to the good brain foods, those antioxidants and those um, good fats to be able to rebuild and support my body on the inside. So it had less work to do and more healing was able to happen. Uh, that was a lot of things that my mom had after her education that she was able to support me with. Um, and then reiterating the importance of sleep and rest. I think if when I was really trying to get back into friendships in my friend group and trying to be a normal teenager, they didn't understand the, the amount of rest that I still needed and that I couldn't do all nighters and that I couldn't go to school dances. And um, they just weren't always able to put their, their themselves in my shoes. And so that would be the biggest, um, I guess, takeaway that I would have for other people that are surrounded by people who have sustained a concussion. 
mm. to be able to kind of put put yourself in their shoes and the symptoms that they're overcoming uh, because it really puts a different perspective on just a, a day because it's so much more demanding. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what, and again, I think you may have touched on this, but are there any other like lessons that you've learned through this experience that you'd like to, to share? Always coming back to that everything happens for a reason and whatever that looks for you. I know I talked about how that was service for me. I was service oriented really from, from the get go. I had issues with reading when I was younger due to the home situation that I was overcoming. Uh, I was, it was many grade levels below in literacy and in reading. And so um, when I finally reached grade level in literacy in eighth grade, I started reading to classrooms and doing a lot of book drives and whatnot. So service above self is just the name of the game for me. And it's the most rewarding thing for me. But find what's rewarding for you, other passions. Um, I know a lot of brain injury survivors and concussion survivors love utilizing art as a form of healing and teaching art classes for other people who have sustained a concussion. You can do that on Zoom if you can do screens and um, being starting podcasts. Things like this is what always helps me feel like benefiting the community in in a bigger capacity than just surviving life. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about what has happened since. So you said that about five years out, eight years out, you were starting to feel a lot better and you went and you, you did college. (laughs) I had (laughs) congratulations on graduation last June. So um, yeah, let us, let tell us a little bit more about the rest of the story so far. Yeah. So I mentioned that my sophomore year, I was able to um, kind of take more on. And one of the goals that I had for my life <laughs> before I sustained a concussion, most of those goals pretty much went out the window because I wasn't able to dance anymore. I wasn't physically as active. I wasn't a great student anymore. And so I kind of had to let go of some of those goals. Um, but one goal that I had was graduating a year early. So I wanted to graduate high school at the end of my junior year and not have a senior year. And um, where my social life was such a struggle for me in high school, that became even more of a fire to uh, be able to accomplish that. So I was able to take a lot on my junior year. My mother would never let me do a gym class in high school again after my concussion. So I did online gym classes and I did, uh, I did these like gym hours. So I took kickboxing classes just with a bag. Nobody, no, nobody boxing me. (laughs) I just boxed a bag. Um, and so I would rack up my gym hours and in those other forms that I was able to mostly my junior year, I had to make up all of these gym, gym hour credits. And so I took every single block. I took a class. I was able to pretty much be a good student. I wasn't I wasn't an amazing test taker after my brain injury just from the memory issues, but I was always able to write a good essay and apply knowledge that I had gained throughout the the class and whatnot. So I graduated um, in 2016. I should have been in the class of 2017. I stayed at home and I um, went to our community college and got my associate's degree to save a bunch of money. I went to the University of New Hampshire for one year. I studied neuroscience and behavior before then going on to get my doctorate at Sherman College of Chiropractic in South Carolina. So it's definitely, school's never been easy for me after my concussion, but um, once I was able to come to peace with the concept of not having to be perfect, I'm an old, I'm the oldest child. And so I definitely have that perfectionism syndrome or whatever you call it, where I have to be the best at everything. <laughs> um, so once I finally let go of the fact that I don't need to have A's and everything and um, that I could go throughout school in my own um at my own pace and at my own level and try my best and apply myself to the best of my abilities, I was able to to do much better in school and have much more peace surrounding that. (laughs) Good thing. (laughs) That's a very good thing. Yeah. It sounds like the the injury has impacted. Well, were you already planning on going that route or did your injury impact your decisions on schooling? 
it really did impact my decisions on schooling. I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated high school and was pretty confident I wanted to do something in the healthcare field. I obviously studied neuroscience and behavior at the University of New Hampshire because of all of the um, neurodevelopmental and just neuroscience I was able to experience from a young age from this um, side of being a concussion survivor and seeing all of the um, all the different things that our brain really does control absolutely everything. And so I found that absolutely fascinating. I still think it's so cool, but I have a huge passion for kids and pediatrics. I always have. So I didn't know if I wanted to be an OB or a midwife or what I wanted to do, but I saw the power and healing of the nervous system, which is chiropractic and making sure that our brain and our toes can communicate optimally together back and forth because those messages go both ways. And um, so I have specialized in becoming a pediatric and prenatal chiropractor. So I plan on opening up my own family practice um, and continuing to take a lot of special education into the concussion world and how concussions and chiropractic play a role together and how they can be synonymous in helping that healing happen, as well as focusing on uh, those babies, which absolutely have my heart. (laughs) I love babies too. That's awesome. (laughs) I love this. This is uh, sounds like a really good fit. And really, I think there's a lot of good that you're going to keep doing in the world. So that's Thank awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so tell me, is it well, before I want to hear more about the things that you're doing to help bring awareness to concussions. I'm excited to hear about that. But is before we jump into that, is there anything else that you want people to know about concussions or your experience thus far? I think every concussion is so unique my symptoms and the things that I did to overcome them are so different than some what other people experience. And so remembering that absolutely every concussion is so unique. Your healing process is unique. It's not going to look like my process um, and it doesn't need to is, is really accepting the uh, path to healing that you have because it is unique and true and purposeful for you. Beautiful. Thank you. So, yeah. So now tell us more about what you're doing to further the cause of bringing awareness to this post-concussion syndrome. Absolutely. So it was challenging once I had to move to South Carolina because there's no um, graduate school for chiropractic here in New Hampshire. So I was a peer-to-peer lecturer. So I would speak to a lot of high schools throughout the state in middle schools about concussions. But I moved off to South Carolina in 2019. uh, But I had founded National Concussion Awareness Day in 2016. So I created that with the patent and pending office. So it's the third Friday of every September, which was the day that it had initially started for New Hampshire's Concussion Awareness Day. I had been appointed by Governor Maggie Hassan in the state of New Hampshire to the Youth Legislative Advisory Council. So I served two terms on this uh, board of young adults and teens in the state of New Hampshire. So we would write up our stances on any bills that came to the House or the Senate that affected the teens and the youth of the state. So I had this uh, unique opportunity to be able to get involved with some legislation at a young age. I think I first started there when I was uh, 15. So after my brain injury. Wow. And um, so I had a passion for kind of doing things like that. So I created New Hampshire's Concussion Awareness Day with the help of Governor Maggie Hassan creating that proclamation. Um, and then obviously concussions don't just happen in New Hampshire. So I figured out how to make a national concussion awareness day and got that all registered for the third Friday of every September. I wanted it to always land on a school day. And I felt like September was that back to football, back to school in that swing of sports. It was the month that everybody in my town had gotten their baseline testing if they participated in sports. And I wanted conversations to happen, especially at the educational level of that elementary, middle school and high school, um, so that if another competitive dancer or somebody who doesn't play any sports, just like myself, sustains a concussion, they have a little bit more of a basic understanding of concussions than I did, uh, because it was not talked about enough. It may have been a quarter of a day in my health class, and I don't remember anything about that, (laughs) nor does many other young adults. So um, 
that was really why I started National Concussion Awareness Day was just to create more conversations and awareness, especially with the use of social media and sharing more stories to just create more awareness. And then I have continued to work with Senator, she's now a Senator, (laughs) our Governor Maggie Hassan is now Senator Maggie Hassan. And so she uh, submits a proclamation to the House and Senate floor, a resolution to be passed to recognize National Concussion Awareness Day in the legislative system, which is quite cool. Uh, So I was able to meet with her just this past Friday to thank her again for her partnership in creating that and making that uh, possible. I also have founded Lessen the Impact, which is an organization that stemmed off of that blog, that wee little blog that I started after my concussion. Um, I knew I wanted to make an impact in a greater capacity. So it's an educational school program that I created to be able to speak to students and share my story and the importance of taking concussion seriously, as well as highlighting how important invisible injuries as a whole need to be taken seriously. So I touch on autoimmune diseases. I touch on um, depression, anxiety, um, challenges of home life. I talk about personal story with my father who was addicted to drugs and alcohol and so on and so forth. And I um, now get to talk a lot about concussions, whether it be on podcasts like this or um, radio shows or um, newspapers or what have you. I have a great passion on just talking anything concussions. (laughs) Yes, I think it is so important. And that is exactly why I'm doing this podcast because word needs to get out. People need to know that what they're dealing with is one, that they're not crazy and it is recoverable. Like <laughs> You can heal with concussion. And I think there are still people who are told to sit in a dark room and we need to get the word out that that's not the way. That's <laughs> so, not the way anymore. No, it's not the it, way. It never was, but we didn't know that before. I guess. Yes, we didn't know. We didn't know. <laughs> we have to use what we have. The brain yes. is so immensely cool and amazing that we're going to continue to learn so much about the brain and how rehabilitation should look. So I'm sure it's not going to look the way it does today in another 10 years. So we got to roll with the punches and do the best that we can with the times. (laughs) Into that. That is awesome. And so I'm just curious with the lesson, the impact, is that local to New Hampshire? Like, what are you, are you going into school still? Or how does that work? What is... I still do quite a few school talks. I've done it in South Carolina. I've taught in Florida and New Hampshire. So I will travel anywhere. It is completely free. So it's a, it's a passion that I have to make sure that our program and concussions really get talked about in our schools uh, because it's really not put in the curriculum. And to be able to change especially public school curriculum is really challenging. (laughs) And so um, even, oh my goodness, even in my doctoral studies as becoming a chiropractor, we had an emergency procedures class and injuries. Um, And so head injuries were part of that. And the information that we got about concussions was so incredibly outdated. I I'm not a person to get into fights, but I was so frustrated with the, um, the, the protocols and the education that we were giving as becoming doctors. Um, and so yeah. it, it's really outdated and it's hard to change curriculum and so on and so forth. And textbooks have been printed and we're still using textbooks from however long ago. And do they, genu- do they genuinely get updated even though there's a new year, new print year? No, they really don't get it. They don't, don't get updated. So um, I found that that speaking to students and being a concussion survivor, they're so much more readily able to accept and be engaged in my presentation than an adult coming in to talk to them about concussions. Yeah. And it's it's just such a different perspective. So um, I think it's so important that we get into every school. I um, I sent out a documentary of the Heads Up yeah, a documentary to every single school across the nation about concussions because I wanted it to be put in their libraries. <laughs> Sick. That's awesome. Was that just recently that that happened? No, that was so long ago. I um, It was a very tedious process to be able to find the name. I had to find the name of the nurse for every single high school because I didn't want them to just uh, open the package and throw it away if I just wrote it to the school so yes that was probably in 2017 i uh i i 
Yeah. I, I really did that. That's so funny to think back on. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Um, and so as Miss New Hampshire, is that your platform is bringing awareness to confessions is that's continuing on with this? Yes, I have continued on with this. Graduating as a doctor of chiropractic, I wanted to kind of um, broaden the idea of what I had to offer as a candidate for Miss America. So I talk about brain and body health and well-being uh, because I also started a, another nonprofit called Choose Health. So you can find that at choosehealthamerica.com. And um, so I talk about living substance free and the power of the proper amount of sleep and eating the right amount of foods and moving your body and that um, how that is so powerful because that's also not talked about in schools enough. Um, so I also talk about that and of course my brain injuries and concussion awareness. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. Well, this, I love what you're doing. I'm so grateful for, yes, your advocacy and the awareness that you're putting out there and for your willingness to share your story with us today. Thank you so much. How can people find you or connect with you if they want to hear more about what you're doing or get involved with any of your organizations? Absolutely. I am on Instagram and Facebook. My Instagram is Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-E-A Mills. And um, you can also find more information about Lessen the Impact at lessentheimpact.org or to South America. And I also have the beginnings of my blog from way back in the day is on that Lessen the Impact website if you want to see how it how it all really began. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we will link all of that in the show notes. So thank you again. I really appreciate your time and sharing your experience and story with us. You're doing amazing things. Thanks. For, thank for- you so much for having me. I'm so glad you listened in today. I hope you have gained some helpful insights and inspiration regarding dealing with and recovering from concussions. My goal is to create more awareness and education about concussions and the fact that there is so much that can be done to improve life after someone has had one. Help me spread the message by liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to this podcast and share it with others who would benefit from hearing it. There are more resources available on my website. And again, if you or someone you love would benefit from concussion coaching, sign up for a free consultation using the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Thank you. See you next time and take good care of that amazing brain of yours.